All right, I'm going to try to talk loudly. Can you hear me? Yeah. I don't know her name. Okay. Um, so I'm a doctor in literature, um, comparative literature from Yale, actually. And um, so not a biologist, but my dad was a famous taxonomist. He just died a couple of years ago of COVID, unfortunately. Um, and so this is, this is really a humanist looking at the field of botany. Um, it's all nonfiction, but I wanted to know the human interest stories behind these, this world. Because, you know, most floral guides just give you the common name, the Latin name, and they tell you how to distinguish the leaves, and that's it. They might say, used for tea. And I always wanted to know more. I think we connect with anything through stories, don't we? That's just what it is to be human. So I want to know what's impressive. Does it have the longest roots? Does it have amazing flowers? Tell me something that I can remember. So I just decided there was no book like it, so I decided just to write it. It took me about seven years. And um, then I had to do a balancing act of which have the most interesting stories and then which are the most common. Because I didn't want to write a really interesting story about something you'd never see, nor did I want to write something that was really, really common that was really not interesting. So I tried to I tried to find the balancing point. So let's get started. So what I'm going to do is go into. Um, I want to go into three stories. So I just do it this way. Three, three stories really in depthly, uh, and then I'm going to do a bunch of little quick ones. And then after about uh, 45 minutes, I'll do um, invasive species, just really one or two in depth. Just do it. I, can do it. Uh, yeah. I forgot I stole the, I stole the mouse earlier. Okay. Prickly pear, we all know that, right? A very famous plant, very common plant. It's probably kept, I think, native Texans more alive than any other plant because it grows over the whole state and you can eat it. Now, it may not be very tasty, but you can eat it at any time of the year. Most commercial Industries use the, the new leaves when they first come out because they're the most tender. And of course, you have to get rid of the spines um, very carefully before you do anything. And they have a very lemony flavor. How many have eaten a nopal? Oh, well, okay. I'm just talking. I forget. And the master naturalists know everything. You know, there are other audiences I talk to like, eat a cactus? So um, they, they go way back in thousand years. People have eaten forever. Boil, steam, roast. They're rich in vitamins. Um, and they possibly protect against diabetes. There's been a lot of um, return to research on diet because diabetes is so widespread. And the greatest incidence of diabetes in North America is among the Pima Indians of Southern Arizona. The more native blood you have, the more after the diabetes. And um, that owl did not like that. Um, Anyway, so there's been, uh, you know, basically Europeans were adjusted to a diet of fat. Think of cows and cheese. Um, but Native Americans were not. And so they have what's kind of called the, fat, the feast or famine um, gene, which means they, they go through long periods with nothing and then they can feed. But the trouble is Europeans came in and gave them lard and fat and salt and their, their bodies went crazy. So, I mean, we're all affected by diabetes, but Native Americans even more. Anyway, so there's been a lot of research into uh, native plants that actually, I can't really explain it to you, but they keep the, the sugar load even and high in fiber. And so this is one that, that's often looked at in that regard. I'm sorry, I throw your mouse again. <laughs> you have no control. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody unmuted and that got weird there for a second. Yeah, it's okay, so it works now. Okay, try now. Does it have a lot of moisture in it? There we go. Has a lot of what? Moisture. Well, yes, it does. I'm not sure that's what the reason is though for. I think of it more as fiber and consistency. You don't have these big sugar highs and drops. So um, the pads were used for a lot of other things as well, um, especially in strange things like a pouch. Why would you use a prickly pear um, pad for a pouch? But if you think about it, um, pottery would have been very hard to carry. 
and you can't always just grab a hide. So um, you could whack off a pad, get rid of the spines, and then slit it laterally and poke it open. And you have like a baggie. And in archaeological sites, they they found um, juniper tobacco. It's not really. I mean, I guess they were smoking juniper uh, in it. And fish inside, which is very strange. But um, a lot of desert survivalists have talked about you can make delicious um, meat by sticking it inside a prickly pear pad and putting it right on the coals because the wetness and moisture just kind of bake it like shake and bake kind of thing. Um, Spanish sources tell us they were using them as canteens, pouring out a hole and pouring water in them. This sounds very strange to me, but apparently it was documented. And then there's a bunch of medicinal uses. Um, think of aloe vera, the goopy, the goopy mucilaginous gel of prickly pear, um, where inflammation burns, uh, sunburn, bruises, boils, um, topical healing agent. And then it's a really strange one, moccasin varnish. This is the gel again, pain fixer, candle hardener, emergency sunblock. So your plane crashes in West Texas, there are no trees, the sun's burning you, you get black charcoal out of your fire, you mix it with prickly pear goo and then smear it all over you. It seems like that would just make you hotter, but if we at least keep the sun from burning your skin. Water purifier, that sounds really weird, but if you have like a muddy, um, mud hole full of muddy water and you need to clarify it, you can take the, the gel and stir it around and wait, it floats to the top and you wait about 30 minutes or an hour, it will very slowly sink. And as the gel sinks, it leaves the water above clearer than the water below. Um, this sounds crazy, but they were using it in Algeria, particularly pair of native only to, uh, all cactus are native to the new world, but they were using it in Algeria to rid ponds of mosquito larvae because the mosquito larvae are trying to breathe at the top and the gel which is dragging down. So, we are, are we okay? No. Oh. They can hear you, but somehow or another the screen share got messed up on this. Okay. I'm gonna go to this. Okay. Um, so we find them in caves throughout the West uh, with little attachments on them. And then there are these weird um, pictures uh, pictographs, and you see these things dangling from shaman arms, and people have thought those are prickly pear pads on strings, but we'll see a different theory at the end. Sorry. All right, can you push that up? Let's see if it works now. All right. Of course, as master naturalists, you know, a bunch of native animals don't just think of humans, but what other, what other things in nature use? All these animals loves to eat prickly pear pad, especially white-tailed deer, which a study showed that like 40% of their diet sometimes be a prickly pear pad. Cows will also eat the pads, especially in times of need. And USDA has variously promoted and dissuaded people from it. I mean, you want a little bit of pear, par, they call it, on their land in times of drought. Um, but ideally, they have the propane burners come out and they burn them. And the cows come running when they hear the burning. But um, because you don't want the spines on it, if the spines get all in their lips, they get what's called par mouth, and it's not a good situation. But they, they can help keep your cattle um, through really bad droughty times. Then uh, all these animals use prickly pear for protection because you've got those wonderful spines keeping you, keeping predators away. Um, the flower. I guess I left off my intro. The intro is this, this plant is amazingly useful. It's like no one part of it that's not useful. Um, the flowers are perfectly edible. You could, they don't taste like much, but you could decorate a salad with them. Um, the only thing I would say is get rid of the sepals and um, stamens. Those will be bitter, but the, the petals will not. And they, uh, they found pollen and co coprolites, either uh, fossilized human feces, going way, way, way back. So we know that people have been eating them for a long time. I'm plugging two books that, you, if you didn't know about them, that are really good for useful, edible, dye kind of plants. One is a, a, a tried and true, Galena Tall. I think it's already in the second edition or third, um, edible and useful plants in Southwest. I think the harder for a book was on dyes, and then it kind of grew to other things. Um, Foraging Texas just came out. Um, young couple, I had lunch with them recently. I haven't read it yet, but I know they've gone to uh, real links to think of real real recipes, exactly how you can make whatever. 
right? Whether it's a jam or a jelly or a slide, whatever, they don't just say, you can try them, they give you explicit directions. So that's cool. Um, okay. Of course, there's the tuna, which is um, super abundant and can be very, very sweet. And they've been used by everyone forever, They're rich in vitamin C. Um, and whole, whole tribes um, would gather in times of, uh, in the summers, it's almost like Christmas to celebrate and have um, dances and do treaties surrounding these um, fruits. We know this because Texas is very lucky that this guy, Cabeza de Vaca, sort of shipwrecked on our shores in 1528 after having participated in some horrible bellicose tax in Florida and whatnot. Anyway, um, amazing story. He's stuck in Texas for like seven years, and uh, he was a prisoner at first, then he sort of escapes and kind of becomes a shaman healer with two other people, uh, eventually makes his way back to Mexico and eventually back to Spain. Apparently, he never got he never slept in beds after he got back to Mexico and Spain because he was so used to sleeping on the ground. Anyway, because of him, we know a lot of little tidbits before, I mean, Texas is responsible for some of the first plant observations in the New World because these Spaniards got there so early. Anyway, he said that during the winter, when the times were starving and cold, the Indians would say, don't worry, soon it's going to be tuna time. And tuna time was like six months in the future that they would say that. So imagine your kid... Um, you know, whining, and you tell them, like, Santa's coming. Don't worry, Santa's coming. I only like it this July when you're telling them. Uh, so why is picking hair fruit such a big deal? I was making myself think through it. And, um, well, what if you wanted something to sweet, uh, something sweet to eat in Texas? So it's 1492. You're in Granbury. The lake is just a little dried-up river, and you're, um, you want something sweet. What have you got? Uh, well, would you have sugar? No, it's from New Guinea. Uh, doesn't reach America until the 1600s. Would you have had? That's New Guinea. Would you have molasses? No, not the sugar cane products. You wouldn't have that. Would you have honey? Yeah. No. It's the honeybees. The honeybees that we get honey from is European. So it was brought in with the Spanish and the uh, the English. So you would have had natural fruits. Oh, I, I'm sorry. When this first came out, I was playing with this stupid thing. So, <laughs> um, you would have had natural fruits. So you're a master of naturalist. What natural fruits would there be? What? Agave. Agave? Agave. Well, you mean like the y yucca fruit? <laughs> well, also when you, when you well, let's keep Plums. going. Plums, okay. Let's stay great. Let's stay great. It's not sweet, though. No. <laughs> Yeah. I do berries. Okay. Do. The ones I thought of are agarita, mulberries, persimmons, maypops if you're in East Texas, that's passion flower. But most of these are they either ripen sporadically or they're very short season or they're not particularly sweet. So um I think what was special about tunas were just massive amounts of fruit. Now they're not all sweet at the same time, but they more or less you know reach peak maturity at the same time. And they're just massive. And so just hordes of people could descend upon these uh, Pritlicker hatches, I think, north of San Antonio, and just feast on them. And then they could be dried and stored like figs. This is huge. Before refrigeration, anything that could be kept beyond its time was a big, big, big thing, right? Because um, everything was spoiled, right? This little fuzzy stuff on the cactus pad is not a fungus. It is the waxy um, web of the female scale insect called Dactylopius or cochineal. And this is the source of the dye cochineal. It's fun to show children. Malia, right? you, you rub this stuff in your fingers and you get the red stuff. And it's bright red. And the imperial robes of the Aztecs, European royalty took it on. The officers go to the British. And not the rank and file. They had the sort of ugly matter root. It was a much more um, maroon color. Anyway, um, it's hard to imagine, but from out of New Spain, Mexico, this was the third most important um, export. Gold was first, silver was second, 
and this ground up bug was third. Because you have to remember that before um, the animal and dyes of the 19th century, which are a, are a petroleum product, before that, all dyes were very needy. They were much more gentle, much more pastel, right? And to get a bright, vibrant dye that held was rare. So to get this color was extraordinary. And that's why people would pay so much for it. Um, and it's a fascinating subject. You can look it up. There are many books written about it because the Europeans didn't know what it came from. And the Mexicans had a monopoly in Spanish. And they didn't want anyone to know. And people thought it was a plant, a seed. They look like seeds, but they're little buds. No one knew that. Um, so it puzzled everyone for centuries. And just when they found out that the aniline dyes were invented, and suddenly it wasn't a big deal anymore. But, you can do this yourself, by the way. It doesn't take any rocket science. Just take a paintbrush and, and scrape it off and it in a Tupperware container, go home and boil it, maybe like an hour, and you'll, you'll see it. It, it turns into a beautiful red. Uh, and then strain it. That's important. Do it's full of little spines. Strain it through like a t-shirt, and then you can get all sorts of colors. They're very lovely dyes. Make all sorts of colors. So there are a few things the legislature does by a coup of, but this is one of them. <laughs> and then they quickly bear the state plan. Okay. The second one I'm going to do a deep dive in is mesquite. And um, you have that around here, though. You know, I'm not really sure it was native here. Um, it's really a tree more of far west Texas and south Texas, but of course, we know the cattle drives pulled this plant all over the place because the cows would eat them and then poop them. A cow patty would have several thousand seeds and they spread all over the state to places they wouldn't have been. I imagine the seed was probably native here sporadically, like just here and there, but you wouldn't see groves of them. Do you see groves of it up here? Oh yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> Um, of course, it's been building material, very hard, very great wood, used by everyone that ever uses it, uses it for wood. Um, this is unusual, hexagonal street pavers in San Antonio. I thought that was really weird. Otherwise, that's basic stuff, and beautiful, beautiful turnings by various people all over the state. Wood is a fuel, very important. Um, an uh, early botanist, Haver, tells us it was the most common fuel from San Antonio all the way to San Diego. It's very hot and smoky. I don't have to persuade any of you of how good mesquite is. Uh, it's a whole industry to itself. Um, interesting, the more west you go, the more the mesquite gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And when they collected the firewood, it was really from the roots, not so much the tree. These roots go out really long, like 20 feet at a time, 100 feet away in places. And some guys said that in Texas and the Southwest, men dig for their wood and climb for their water. Can you, can you guess what climbing for the water is? Windmills. Oh. Uh, to climb your windmill to fix them. <laughs> the beans have so much been forgotten. This was probably the most important food throughout the Southwest. I mean, I said the prickly pear cactus for Texas, but for the Southwest, I would choose this. Why? Because it regularly fits out, if not one, two crops per year. And unlike um, acorns and, and pecans, it doesn't mask. It tends to be very regular in its supply of, of fruit. Um, sugar, iron, soluble fiber, and lots of protein. Very, and you can store it. If you make a meal from it, this is hard to describe. It's not the seeds. Okay, it's not the beans. Nor is it the cover of the casing. It's the meso, it's the goop inside the husk. Does that make sense? So you smash it and you're actually gonna throw out the seeds and you're gonna throw out any little bits that don't get mushed up. But you're left with a sort of brown flour, kind of moist flour that can be sun dried and then kept in depth and then you can rehydrate it when you want. Every Native American group used it throughout the Southwest. Very, very important. And you can still find, uh, you can find, I was coming, kind of having a comeback. You can find the skin flower in Whole Foods, and maybe in terms of uh, Whole Foods. But um, I think sometimes it's not made from our mesquite. It's made from some African ones. But anyway, it's the same idea. And of course, there's mesquite honey and jelly. Um, again, one of those products that's been looked at for helping uh, attack diabetes. 
Finally, the third deep dive, a very strange time, with a very, very unusual history. Because everyone that touched it has a totally different story from it. Um, so you've seen these, right? Yeah. Okay. These are the females. This is off the feet of females and males. These are off the female trees. You don't want to be hit on the head by one. <laughs> so for Native Americans, it was the wood. The wood was amazingly strong, but flexible. So it's, it's, and it's very little affected by humidity. And that makes what a fantastic bow. Mm -hmm. And second, it's the greatest bow wood in North America after Pacific U. And of course, there's no Pacific U in our part of the country. So it's the premier um, wood. And you can, you can go online and Google um, bow dark bow making. And there are clinics um, all over. There was one in Goldway um, huh. uh, recently. Anyway, these are Caddo archers um, using their bows. And so the French, who were trading up and down the Mississippi, um, that's where this word came from. Black, the French for wood, dock of the bow. So it's wood of the bow, black dock, black dock, bow dock, bow dock. Got corrupted into bugs. Um, and it was a um, traded all over the place. Not only the wood, but even the seeds. And so you'll see strange, like out in Solitario in Big Ben, you'll see like uh, a random boat art, and you're wondering, like, what is this doing here? It's like all by itself. There's no other boat art scheme. And it's the way they think, because Indians were planning them to have it. Um, traded all as far away north to Black, the Black Bean tribe in Montana. So this is sort of the home range today. It wasn't the home range in the past. So these uh, these guys um, brought some samples to this man over here, Pierre Chinto. He was an Indian agent. He was fluent Osage Orange. That's a fluent Osage language. That would be irrelevant, except that he was the major contact for these guys who were headed west and who, remember, no one's been west of Mississippi. Jefferson sends them to find a, a river to the northwest, hope that the northwest passes. But everything they're sending back were new, new to science. And in the very first shipment they sent back to the East Coast was samples of Bogart. Um, and there, so now here's the second big turn. So there's rumor that they make a good hedge. And uh, Jefferson is spreading around to his friends. It's under cultivation by 1880. So it reaches Virginia. Patrick Henry has a huge one in his yard, Rock Mill, Virginia. Um, and Prairie Farmer magazine starts spreading to the fame of the uh, Bonar hedges. And so I started asking myself, why are hedges so important? So once you get out of the eastern deciduous forest and you're heading west, you just cross the cross timbers and you're in the first prairies, there are no trees. So what are you gonna what are you gonna build? Well, how are you gonna you know, close your close your livestock? There's no stones in good prairie soil. And um, there are very few trees on the prairie. And lumber isn't cheap if you have to ship it. And this is probably before the railroad anyway. Um, of course, once the railroad is built, then they can ship it easily. Anyway, so how do you how do you enclose your lots to protect them? So I think that's why hedges were so important. Um, they're heat, drought resistant, rapid growth, they make zorny, thorny, zigzaggy branches. And you, they said within four to five years, you could have a hedge that was pig tight, horse high, and bull stomp. <laughs> it's made a pig couldn't wiggle through it, and a horse couldn't jump it, and the bull couldn't push it over. Oh. And seeds were being put in barrels uh, on the steamships in Jefferson along with cotton um, to be shipped to the Midwest. And it's, it was one of the few trees that's been um, artificially spread by man so extensively so that they could make hedges from it. Well, the next twist and turn is someone was looking at a Bogart branch with the thorns and thought, hmm, I bet I could invent something that looks just like that. And supposedly the inspiration for Barbar, the guys who invented Barbar, came from looking at Bogart um, twigs. But then Bogart gets the last laugh because what are you going to, what post are you going to pin your horn uh, onto? So there weren't any trees. The only trees that were there were, were Bogart. Which is amazingly uh, resilient wood, 
and it's very, very impermeable. It's very resistant to any kind of water infiltration of insects. So it is a perfect uh, wood to use. So I hear you had to get the staples in while they were green, because once the wood dried, you weren't getting the staples. Um, so mm -hmm. Charles Goodnight, the famous Texas uh, cow, um, first, what do you say? Cow Baron. Uh, supposedly invented the first chuck wagon and the wood he used for the boat. Mm -hmm. They're used for all sorts of things, house piers. I mean, I've been told, in fact, that back in the day, I think in Dallas, if your house, if your pier and being house set on boat on piers, you got like a tax reduction, like back in the day or something like that. Uh, that could just be urban legend. But it's a very, very, very strong wood. Uh, it's a beautiful golden wood when you first cut it, but then it turns brown with time. It's a good uh, tone wood. They make little like beast balls and um, animal balls um, out of them. Excellent. Now to that. Nature is by itself, we know, conservative. Nature would not make this enormous fruit. Mm -hmm. for, oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Uh, folk tales said that uh, what this what this was good for was um, keeping roaches. Did you ever hear that? Yeah. yeah. You can chop it up and put it like under your sink, and it keeps them away. And scientists um, look at this, and sure enough, there's a chemical, this two, three, four, five tetrahydroxysilvane, that apparently really does keep roaches away. So now to my point, would. Nature make that fruit to be dispersed by that fruit. <laughs> no. If you want squirrels to go after it, hackberry would be perfect. A little tongue around it, right? Well, the only other animal that people see eating is this. But horses, they made it? They were. They were. Yeah. That's the critical piece. They were. They actually were originated, original to Native North American plains. But then they disappeared, disappeared in the Pleistocene die-off period. And then they were brought back. But uh, that is a good clue because um, certain scientists have proposed, and I think they're probably right, that the animals that this fruit was developed for naturally were the extinct Pleistocene megafauna that roamed everywhere. The brown sloths, the mammoths, the mastodons. There are a number of, you know, the fruit's big enough those big teeth and chew on it. The seeds are tiny, which means they get caught in their teeth and or pass through. Um, so these is a number of characters I can't really go into that would make sense for these big animals. And there's your Pleistocene books. Um, so I think that was just kind of, oh, they, they found a Bodark um, pollen um, throughout lakes in, in the great um, in the Midwest, throughout the plains. Um, like 10,000 years ago, it was very abundant. It was very widespread throughout the central part of North America. And it's now shrunk back to this tiny little place in Northeast Texas um, and Southeastern Oklahoma and Southwest Northeast. So uh, the stands, that's the only place where there's like really dense growths of Bogar, is that little place along the Great River. Yeah. Um, but once it was once extensive. So the poor plant lost, it, it lost its uh, dispersal agents. They all disappeared. Mm -hmm. It's unclear if they did the base, right? Did the people kill all of these, or did, were they dying off already from climate change or whatever? And then the people just kind of helped them. I don't think, think that we've come to a solid conclusion on that. I think probably both. Right. So, little short stories. They're, they're everywhere. I've added two new ones at Bob's request because I'm up here. So, post note, Corcus Salata. Um, Roy Benichek that wrote Adventures with a Texas Naturalist, or one of the first naturalist books in Texas, um, calls it a picturesque rock man. <laughs> I'm not sure. Why do you think he calls it a rock man? I don't know the answer. I'm guessing that it's not, the canopy's kind of broken and stingy. It's not like really, really full, like some of them. And it kind of warty and knobbly a little bit. But it has to survive out here in this heat. It does so pretty well. Anyway, it uh, has um, these very distinct leaves. They usually have five lobes, one, two, three, four, five, but they often form a Maltese cross, which looks like that, in case you don't know. And the underside of the leaf has stellate hairs. You might 
Uh, you might see them with your naked eye, but it helped if you had a loop of magnifying glass, and that's where it gets its name, Stabat, like a star. <clears throat> it is the um, dominant tree of the cross timbers. All of you should know what the cross timbers are, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, it's where the it's the last dying gasp of the eastern deciduous forest before it hits the prairies. So it's the last thing that the the um, pioneers were coming out of those thick woods and suddenly they would see prairie. But then suddenly a whole bunch of woods again. And then suddenly a whole bunch of prairie. And so they call this the uh, cross timbers because they're coming from this way, crossing over. And if you look at these maps, you can pretty you know the trees, right? The flight. Um, you can tell it, you know immediately what soil and what soil is in where the trees are. Sand, sand, right? And the grass is growing on clay, usually. And so and you can almost tell exactly what you thought by just observing what trees are growing on. Um, my dad was really good at botany because he had a lot of geology first. And if you just did a geology map of the, of the soils of Texas, you can then tell when you're likely going to hit new species if you're going to go into a totally different soil. Right? So there's your county, good county. And you can see it's all messed up. You guys, you guys got a little bit of everything over here. Um, oh, yeah. The, everyone seems to say if you have one in your yard, leave it alone. But they have very fine roots that go down that sand. And if you compact the sand, you'll, you'll kill them. And highway machinery, heavy machinery running over those roots really will kill them. I've seen it happen in Austin a lot. They're trying to, they're not trying to kill the tree, but they just keep running over that area. Um, I've been told don't, don't trim, don't do anything. They fertilize, they know what they're doing, leave them alone. <laughs> so um, they're kind of smallish, you're not gonna get good timber out of them. They're slow growing, which is which is bad for forestry, but good for strong wood. They often can be crooked, crooked and knotty and holy. So what are they good for? Well, posts, hence the name, because they're short. Railroad ties, a lot of them were made into railroad ties, and um, barrel stays. Because um, they're a white oak, white oaks have this red gum that fills the, the, the holes in the, the little cells which makes them very heavy. A live oak uh, limb cut off and just sink. Do you know that? It's not going to go. Um, they're too heavy. Um, and the gum also makes them impermeable, which makes them really good in shipbuilding and in cooperage or barrel making. Um, anyway, it's, it's a white oak, so it has these traits. This is what it's good for. And also what white oaks are good for is their acorns mature in one year instead of two. Red oaks do it too. Because of that, they have less tannins. And tannins are what make acorns so good. Um, every native fruit needs acorns. It's one of those plants, it's one of those food items that just disappeared from our diet. I mean, well, we never had, that's the problem. Europeans think they never need acorns. Um, and we really should. I don't know why we don't. I guess, well, they're hard to crack and you got to get rid of all those um, tannins. But there are ways to do it. And um, it just shows how much we eat is really dependent on what our parents ate and what our grandparents ate, what our culture eats. There's so many food products we could be eating that we're not. Anyway, every native food eats them. And they can be mixed with uh, fat and dried and stool. Um, ash juniper, the other thing Bob asked me to talk about. So in case you didn't know, it's not named from the ashes looked on the limbs. That is probably a fungus. I think they decided it's parasitic, but it doesn't seem to hurt them. But it's named for a guy named Ash. Of course, they make beautiful smelling firewood. Edward Abbey in Desert Solitaire says it's uh, the sweetest fragrance on the face of the earth. Um, in native, all native groups smoke the twigs and leaves for incense and purification. The bark is beautiful, long shredded bark that can be used in all sorts of um, things, baskets and cradles. And of course, cedarwood oil. Um, it's used in all sorts of uh, soaps and wound sprays. I think it's first started in Rock Springs, Texas. Yeah, okay. So the, the big debate with Jennifer is how abundant should it be? Is it even native, et cetera? Um, so here's a prairie that seems to be invaded, getting invaded with Jennifer. And is that 
normal or natural, or is the cedar break on the hills natural, yeah. or should it be more of an open savanna mixture? And um, it's hotly debated. Uh, and often, at one point, they published something that said it wasn't a native plant, so don't plant it. And then everyone had a, got all upset and said, We need to find it. And they said, Well, shh, we just don't want people to think it's, we don't want to go plant it. <laughs> so um, that, they've undone it now, but that caused a lot of people to say, This doesn't belong, let's cut it out. And um, so my dad, I don't know that my dad knew this, but I think what he says makes sense is grasses. Dominate in deep soil. So, deep river bottoms, creek bottoms, wherever there's good soil. And juniper or cedar dominates in thin, rocky soils. So, it just makes perfect sense that they would do well on drought stressed slopes that have no soil, tops of mesas, maybe any, any difficult place. And a lot of the hill country is that. And you can, you can find pioneer. Um, Accounts of standing on the edge west of Austin and looking out a unbroken sea of cedar as far as the eye can see. So I think that had to be natural, but down in the valleys, you would have grasses everywhere. So I guess people are debating different things. Once people moved in, right, two things happened. They fenced the land and sucked the cattle. The cattle aren't a problem because they're like buffalo. But when they're fenced in, they're just going to eat too much and you're going to probably put too, run too many cattle on that land, right? And that eats all the grass and the grass can't hold the soil, so the soil grows. Now, you have rocky, crappy soil that juniper does well in and grass doesn't. Two, you don't want the wildfires coming through, so you do everything you can to stop the wildfires, right? But back in the day, the wildfires were natural. The wildfires were natural. And it uh, would sweep through the grass and burn the grass. The grass is going to come like back next year. But it would kill all those little seeds. Mm -hmm. Once those were stopped and once we fenced it in, now we've got a place where cedar is growing where it quote unquote shouldn't be, which is probably why this, you see, might be a good example where you should go in and get rid of those genetics before they get started. But here, Probably. This is all pretty natural. There weren't that is in deep soil to begin with, probably. And so, anyway, you get into fierce debates about this. And I was told by an ecologist that we know more about Costa Rican uh, forests than we do about hill country. Because no one studied it or knew what was there before it got messed up. Right. So the reason people don't like cedar is because they think it's a water hog. Those studies have now shown that's not the case. It's not it. These are always really complicated. How do you get two saplings of the same type in the same bucket and give them exactly the same water? There's always these different conditions that prevail. And so they think they're measuring the same thing, but they're not really. Anyway, water hogging, and of course, no one likes cedar people. That's what they say. Cedar what? Cedar people. So it's, it's the pollen coming off the male plants. This is a nice windy day in winter. You know, there are times when people think there's a fire. And it's not, it's just it's a pollen. Just yeah. mm -hmm. And of course, there's our beautiful golden sheep warbler, um, who definitely has been living here a long time, flying from Mexico to build its nest. I don't think anyone can say that the, it just recently decided to live in June. Yeah. <laughs> um, the berries, well, our, the ash juniper is so bitter, I don't know that you could really use them. But I hear Germans put a couple in sauerkraut or a stew, just a couple <laughs> to flavor it. Supposedly, crushed up with on salmon. Um, the red one, which you have in this county, the red berry juniper, actually is pulpy and sweet. So it would be more tasty. Um, I've noticed uh, the, the, the Texas spirit industry is going so crazy, I can't keep up. There are so many varieties coming out, and they're all trying to one up each other. We use na native botanicals, we are using them, yeah, which I love the idea that they are. Anyway, this one is using uh, red berry juniper in their mixture. And I don't know if there's anyone using cash. And I'll put it, oh, here's, uh, I just wanted to show you that you are located where both of them grow. Um, I looked out for various specimens. There's red berry juniper on Comanche Key. An active nature center yeah. and uh, Fulton, it might be Fulton Springs and not that. Yeah, like somewhere north, nine miles northwest. Yeah. Has anyone seen Red Bear Juniper around? 
Yeah. It's not um, here and there. Or did you see a full stand of it? It was like up in the center. Is it? Like well, yeah. lots of it. We have we have one. Okay. Okay. This just came out about a year ago. Um, she, uh, she's great. She's a hard she's got like an axe to grind. She's just so mad at these people that they dash green for on native. And she thinks Cedar gets a really bad rap, and she's here to prove them all wrong. So she wrote this great book. She um, revived, she looked at my chapter that I wrote on them and made a few corrections. So I just wanted to know it just got, it just came out. Of course, Agarita, you all know probably, you can make jam and jelly from, but I mean, you've got to get all this fruit out from under the prickles. You might put an upturned umbrella under it and whack them with the broom. You can put a sheet down under them and whack them with the broom. It's hard to get all the fruits off. And then you got to make the jam and jelly. Very beautiful saffron smelling flowers that um, have uh, sensitive stamens. So you touch them, the stamen wax you. <laughs> And agarita means a little sour in Spanish. Um, I don't know if you knew this though, the, uh, the, the bright, bright yellow that's in the, the roots and in the stems is an antimicrobial alkaloid called berberine. It used to be in uh, visine hydrox back in the day. I don't think it is anymore. But um, the Native Americans used it in eyewashes as well. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of Native American uses for eyewashes, and I can't think of why. I guess when you live outside all the time and it's windy in West Texas, you got stuff blowing in your eyeballs. Right? So berry, it's all over the place too. This is not China berry. The easy way to tell is that the fruits are translucent when they're ripe. They're beautiful, golden. You can open up the sun and see that through it and see the black seed in the middle. All you have to do is agitate them in a little water and you've got a perfect soap. Uh, it's a neutral pH, so it's very good for like linens and fine woolens. Been used by Mexicans and Hispanics forever. I'm on seal with a soda. Um, I had a class I teach in spring, I do one field trip and I show them this, and students are always like, I don't know, do you do? So, <laughs> fish stupefaction, a very strange thing. Um, it's an easy way to kill, well, to get the fish to rise to the top, and then you can eat them. So you have to have a sort of sluggish stream, and you kind of dam off a little bit downstream, dam off up so they can't get out, and you toss this in the water, and then they just they can't breathe, and flood up, and then you can grab it. And you can do this with palm leaves as well. And the, uh, the seeds are very pretty, and can be made in all sorts of jewelry. And of course, you'll appreciate the fact that the hair street butterfly times its emergence with the flowering of the tree. Mulberry, leaves are very strange. Red mulberry, well, it's pretty obvious you can eat mulberry. Um, natives were growing them outside their houses very early. Um, colonists were bringing them in meetings, et cetera. Um, it, it's, it doesn't get the respect it deserves, I guess because they ripen sporadically and fall off on dry side animals. But they're perfectly delicious. It's hard to just get a whole lot at once sometimes. But, and of course, they're finding the birds and what not to get them. The other problem is we brought in white mulberry um, for to grow to make silk to raise silkworms on, and then they're not very tasty, and they've hybridized so much with red mulberry that it's even hard to distinguish them. Sometimes the white mulberries are when they're unripe or white, and as they ripen, they get kind of pink. But that looks more than pink to me. These on ours, on the other hand, are red when they're unripe, and they get almost black. Uh, so, of course, you can eat them, preserve them, make them into like raisins, whatnot. But this is what I think is cool. Caddo Indians made bark, paper bark, out of the bark of red mulberry. And they made um, cloth out of it and made skirts out of it. And I just went, what? Is it? I, really? And I can't find any pictures in the archaeological record. I haven't found it. But when I Google it, I never can find anything. But there is this uh, artist depiction in Texas Parking Wildlife, and some of these uh, skirts, I believe, are supposed to be from mulberry fiber. But what I can show you is another member of the uh, mulberry family uh, from the South Pacific that's very famous for a cloth called tapa cloth, and it's used throughout the Pacific Islands. Um, it's a beautiful native cloth. It's been having a revival. So I show these to you as maybe what Caddo India 
uh, cloth and why it looked like. Who knows if it's decorated that much, but who knew? Sumac, a um, bunch of species, but it doesn't matter for our purposes. These berries are nice, sweet, sour, and they can just be crushed and eaten, stick them in your mouth. You can make a uh, goose juice or sumac made out of them. Um, just stick them in warm water for 30 minutes, add a little sugar, delicious. Um, Native Americans ground them up and especially use them to season meats. And I think that's fascinating because the ancient Greeks and Romans did exactly the same thing with the European species of sumac. I'm always fascinated when groups thousands of miles away with no cultural exchange use the same genus for the same thing. And indeed, in Middle Eastern cooking, um, za'atar is one of the most famous uh, seasonings. Um, and I was talking about this. And um, every grandmother makes her own version, but the critical, the critical seasoning seems to be sumac. You can, you can buy this now. I've seen it more and more in stores. Roundup sumac. Um, this is the stuff sumac or this fragrant sumac, depending on what you want to call it. And I just wanted to give you a picture of it. But it turns out to be the most important plant for basketry. Not uh, for, for the coils, the rod, the foundation rods that make the surface. Here's a woman with them there. And uh, this, this basket is even paying homage to it. That's actually a fragrant sumac leaf. I wanted to throw in a wildflower, Coriopsis, huge fields of it, very beautiful. Sure, you've seen it. It's got to be abundant here, right? We, well, it's Latin name. If you know Latin, tinctoria means good for dying. And it makes beautiful dyes, gorgeous dyes. Let's say you don't want to die because we live in the 21st century. We don't die. We, we do drink. So all you have to do is drink it. It makes a delicious tea. The whole plant, the flower, the stems, the leaves, doesn't matter. Just dry it and go. Delicious tea. Good news, right? And I'll end this, this section on uh, Jensen weed, you also call them flower. It's growing in containers in, in the square of Granbury, not the downtown square. We saw it a little bit. Um, it's uh, very toxic. But it had lots of medicinal uses for making you unconscious, for example, or <laughs> asthma. Uh, Texas Cowboys would put small bits of the leaves in tobacco and smoke it. And it really does do that. But boy, you have to be careful. Uh, Belladonna, women used to like to make their pinkles really big. And apparently, maybe that was very, very beautiful. And um, apparently, this this we use for that. Um, wounds and sore externally. If you, I wouldn't touch this plant, but if you were to, don't, don't do it internally. Use it for something else. Um, because the plant is full of basically an intoxicant and delirium, hallucinogenic, and a psychotropic. It's used among various Southwestern groups for ecstatic dances, vision quests. That being said, I looked at a lot, a lot of archaeological stuff on Native American usage, and it's never mentioned. And my only thought is it's considered sacred, and I don't want to talk about it. And we're going to tell the, the white anthropologists what they do with this. I've seen one article that suggested the famous squash blossom, the squash blossom necklaces of Arizona might actually be Jensen weed and not that's just a beer. Is there, isn't there another name for it? Sacred Natura? Natura, Sacred Natura has many names. Yeah. Moon, moonflower, the common one. It gets Jensen weed because in Jamestown, Virginia, Jamestown, Jensen, 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 Jamestown, Virginia, the, the British soldiers were the Americans were pissed off and they helped them and collect those over there, put that in your salad, and they got the yeah. British people yeah. really sick. And for like 12 days, they ran around. This, this is actually it's fully accounted. Ran around naked, acted like monkeys, and they pawed the bears. Um, I'm surprised they didn't die. But anyway, um, that's where it gets its name. Well, anyway, this guy in the 60s wrote this book and made it really popular. And unfortunately, because of this, all these teenagers go out there and try to get high on this hallucinogenic, dangerous drug. And of course, I, they don't know how much they should take or how they should make it. They just boil a bunch of leaves and roots, and then they drink like a whole cup of it, and then they die. Yeah. Um, you die, and what you're getting is anticholinergic poisoning, which has a mnemonic 
hot as a hair, dry as a bone, blind as a bat, red as a beet, and mad as a hat. Because no. you get really, really flushed when you don't sweat, you can't see, and you go crazy. And when I gave this talk to the Taylor Garden Society, <laughs> the woman stood up and said, that sounds exactly like menopause. <laughs> <laughs> so remember these things we saw earlier? Well, there uh, recent uh, archaeologists have thought that maybe this is a depiction of something else. The capsules of this plant, especially this down here, as it's the hissing as it's drying out. Well, uh, when you look at some of these shaman staffs, Especially this one here, you see that, man, I don't know, they don't have the right shape in my mind, but maybe she's right. They're depicting the Tura, not cricket there. Um, but if so, then we have some of the beautiful West Texas uh, Indian art to thank maybe for people being on this road. So that's remarkable plants. And uh, now I'm going to totally switch, switch. Speed, switch speed for like 10 minutes and talk about invasive. Go ahead. Yeah, you got it. Okay. So this is uh, with another British author. He's a, ge he's a geographer and I'm who I am. And we've had many an argument over, in fact, at one point I wasn't sure I could like a book with him. <laughs> he, he's sort of like, it's growing, who cares, let it be. And I'm like, what are you talking about? No, it's not native, get rid of it. And so we had to both kind of come in a little bit. <laughs> so there's invasives that you probably know and think of as invasives. They have a story that you're very familiar with. Water hyphen. Um, it was 1884 in New Orleans in World's Fair, and they were passing out the souvenirs. People took them home and get, put them in their gardens and ponds. Within like five years, they're in, in Florida. Within 10 years, they're, they're taking over the rivers of Florida, St. John's River. Boat, boat navigation becomes impossible, and people are petitioning Congress, you've got to do something. And the Army Corps of Engineers has spotted ever since. Plastic invasion story. Uh, Nutria brought into California. Um, by the way, Hyacinth is from Brazil, and Nutria is from most of South America. So Argentina, Chile, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Brazil. Brought in as a uh, prefer to California in like 1889, I think. And, um, yeah, because it seemed like an easy, cool creature for fur. The trouble is, we don't always want fur. But at the time, they thought it was a good idea. Then the McElhinney family, the Tabasco family in Norland, in Avery, Avery Island, brought him in. They thought this would be great for poor southern hunters, so I'll have something to hunt. And they brought him in down there. And then, then there became a rumor that they would eat water hyacinth. They didn't find it. And so the East Texas Wildlife Association imported them to Cato Lake, 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 Lake in 1950 to eat the water hyacinth that was taking over. Mm. Well, the trouble is they will eat hyacinth, but it's not high on their lips. <laughs> they would rather eat plants that grow in mud like uh, reeds and cattails and sugar cane and rice. And so this is kind of way down their list. So they don't really eat it much. Um, so they've exploded, and people just didn't like fur. People got tired of fur. They tried to call it uh, Hudson Bay Seal. <laughs> that didn't work. Um, so anyway, when 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 the hunters can't get money for the fur, then they stop hunting, and then the population exploded. This is 1990, um, brought into Florida. It's from the western west Asia, western Pacific. It's a beautiful fish, so people want them in their aquaria, especially in Florida, a lot of salt water and aquarium enthusiasts. But what happens when you get out of your aquarium, you do the thing you should never do because you don't mm -hmm. locally. We all need to be careful about this. So um, they started taking off Florida. Of course, they have no enemies and they eat up everything. Uh, they appeared off Galveston in the flower mount, flower garden banks. National Wild Marine Sanctuary. They appeared as 100 miles south of it, and they were appearing there um, in 2011. Um, so they're everywhere, and you can eat them, but you got to catch them, and they've got uh, venomous spines. So um, you can also eat nutria, and they try it. It's really high in protein and low in carbohydrate. It's better than most meats. But who wants to eat a water of rodents? No one. That's the problem. This shows the eat them. 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think there are plenty of Creoles that do it in Louisiana, but it, it's it's a hard sell. It shows how much our cultural prejudice goes into this stuff, right? And then our latest one that just got in the state, Emerald Ash Borer, is according to all accounts, is going to kill all our ashes. There's probably nothing we can do. We got into Michigan, uh, like uh, 1990s. They think through packing crates as larvae. So the inspectors wouldn't have seen that. It's inside the wood of the packing crate. You know, they're busy looking at what's inside the crate, not the crate itself. They come, they come from China. And uh, they probably dumped the crates at some point in, in the woods. And by the time they were noticed, they'd already spread 20 or 50 acres or 100 acres large. They were already spreading. We watched them come down through the Midwest, where they just devastated all the ash. They've gotten closer and closer and closer. Just as we were publishing this book, they had just hit Carnac, Texas. They hadn't found any larvae yet, just a beetle, I think. Um, and then after it had gone to press, it appeared in Fort Worth. An 11 year old took a picture of it on my notes. So that goes to show how important you never know what you're taking a picture of and do it because you never know what it's going to pan. Now, I started Googling this and finding that maybe it actually doesn't. But anyway, it's, it's there now. So I bet they weren't sure what it was. Anyway. Are there any natural predators to build? Not here. There, yeah. there, are, there are, of course, in China. That's the whole problem with invasives, right? Yeah. They don't have the enemies that they have here. Um, it's, it's just, yeah. Okay. But then there are these, these kind of animals that you probably think, well, those aren't even, those aren't even, those aren't even, those aren't even non-native, aren't they? They've been here. Most people just call it a house sparrow, not English. And most people just say starling, not European. But the English sparrow was brought in in 1850. Why? Because American cities have been industrializing. They were noisy and grimy and crowded. The native wildlife, like martins and black well, chickens, were moving out. They didn't want to live in that situation. But they moved out. The little inchworms went crazy. And people said, we need something that will live in a city and eat each inchworm. So they say, I don't know. In Europe, they're the sparrow. They're great. They're, they're wonderful. So they bring them in, and then they didn't quite do what they were supposed to do. <laughs> Starlings are like 40 years later by some nut that wants... Every bird mentioned in Shakespeare should live in America. So he brings all the birds. He, he releases 160 starlings over two years. And now there's 66 million in the United States. 200 million worldwide. A third of the population lives in the U.S., which they would not live here were it not for Mr. Shipline. Um, hogs, they've been here 500 years. They give us bacon. You're going, to, you're going to include them as invasive species? <laughs> oh, no, no, come on, kitty cat. These are pet. Also here for 500 years. No. Do we think of these the same way as before I just showed you a minute ago? Probably not, or at least it's complicated. By the way, hogs were doing any problem until like the last 15 or 20 years. Before that, all the, all the farmers had hogs that ran wild all around their property. They didn't even bother to tag them. And they wanted one, they go out and kill one. They didn't seem to run away and do all this damage. I think there's some theories that when people started putting deer porn out, mm -hmm. that encouraged the hogs to go further away. And then, damn, they went feral. Both these animals went feral very quickly. Okay, you know, I have too much time. For this great um, public Columbian exchange where animal, uh, animals and plants were just moved around the world at will, this was absolutely normal until very recently. Of course, we do this for who? For us, it's about us, it's about humans. We want better products, more fruits, different uh, animals. And there's this worldwide exchange is absolutely normal. There are acclimatization societies whose sole job is to bring cool and different things to our planet, to our country. Um, again, it was all about, it was all seen through a human lens. What is good for us? So back to sparrows. There was uh, basically the supporters love sparrows. They said they'll eat inchworms. They're industrious. They're brave. They're hardy. They're adaptable. They're friendly. They're beloved. They're, they're, they're lovely little animals. So they, what's not to like? And they passed laws that you could not kill a sparrow. Texas has one. You cannot kill a sparrow. They wanted to encourage them. But within about 40 years, <laughs> things sort of looked different. People said they're not actually eating the worms. They're eating the grain and the horse poop that's dropped on the street. And 
I don't think they're so brave and hard. They're aggressive and nasty and they're oversexed and populating in public. Look at children to see them, like John said. And then and they're hurting the chickadees and the bluebirds and the martins, and they squeak and sound. And one thing to notice is how many of these terms are actually uh describing the animal biologically, or how much of them are just reflecting human attitude in general? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's really not about the answer, but this is why when I wrote when we wrote this book, this is why this whole invasive question gets very complicated. Um it's how we perceive harm and how, how we feel about a creature is different and we kind of let it out, you know, our way of thinking. Well, by 1900, the Lacey Act finally gets passed by this guy from Iowa, and I'll spare you all the details, but basically there were four critters, originally sparrows, starling, mongoose, and fruit bats were not allowed to be brought in anymore, but since then it's been amended many, many, many times, there's now 230 animals on the list. Um, so this was the beginning of the sea change. Sparrows actually did it where we started thinking, okay, maybe it's not the best idea to bring in everything. It's not till 100 years later that we actually have a definition under President Clinton for what invasive is. So the first is it has to be non-native. What does non-native mean? How well, you get another academic argument? It's something that wasn't here originally, well, when originally, you know, you can get into this big argument. But a simpler way to do it is a human brought it in. That's an easier definition. If a human brought it to brought it in and introduced it, then it's not made it by definition. I'm a plant guy, but if you're a bird guy, birds fly all over the place. So if a breeding pair, this happened, I don't know which one forgot the name of the bird, gets blown off course by a storm and lands in Greenland and has babies and is thriving, it is now part of the native avifauna of Greenland. Period. There's no discussion about it. Humans didn't bring it in, got there on its own, so it's native. Plants can't do that so easily. So usually it's almost always a human that brought them in, right? And then it has to cause harm, economic. So think of uh, taking over agricultural fields, making it difficult to harvest cotton. Human health, okay, ponds full of mosquitoes and causing malaria, the sluggish water. And then there's environmental harm, which you can imagine of the three, this is the one that's kind of hardest to prove. We all know what you can get a little, two of those three have to do with us again, don't they? Hurts our economy or hurts our health. The environmental one, well, I'm not so sure. Back to this, back to now that you've had the, the Great Sparrow War, how differently we feel about these two creatures. <laughs> They've both been here 500 years. They both are intimately connected with humans. When we brought them both in, One's a food source and one's a love companion. But we don't think about them in the same way at all. Of course, you know the damage the hogs do, right? To the fields, the dirtying the waters, et cetera. Cats are supposed to be the um, single greatest anthropogenic source of mortality to birds and animals in the U.S., killing like 2 billion birds a year and 7 to 11 billion animals. They're excellent comforts. And it doesn't matter if they're feral or not. The issue is can you let them out at night? Keep them, keep them in. You have a cat, keep them in. Anyway. Um, so now a deep dive into salt cedar. So that was just sort of the intro. Here's the real one. Salt cedars are brought in as an ornamental. And you think, well, are they really that pretty? Well, I went to Santa Fe and there's one. They are really quite pretty. Yeah. So they're hitting America as early as the 1820s as an exotic, beautiful plant. Um, they're from Asia, basically. Uh, Part of it is around Iran, Iraq, that area, but they've been widespread all through there. It's in the Bible, too. Um, there's 40 to 50 species worldwide. There's only eight in the U.S. They're hard to tell apart. Usually, uh, only experts do it. Um, but what really helped them spread was people realized they will grow in really drought-tolerant, um, sandy conditions, and they thrive there. And they will help erosion and they will help them serve as great wind breaks. And uh, they appeared in Galveston in 1877. The US Army Corps of Engineers is planting them on San Jose Island to keep the sand from blowing into Port Aransas Pass and closing the pass. Um, so, in all of that, you see, well, there's some up here, a little here on the coast, but what is that? There's something else going on there. And sure enough, it's that. 
The Reclamation Act of 1902 uh, allowed us to dam all the rivers of the West. This is how Phoenix gets its water. This is how all these Western cities, which are now struggling, um, get their water from dams. So what did the dam do that was so damaging? Well, most of these rivers in the West flood in late spring with the snow melt, right? That's when they peak. And they scour out the banks, leaving fresh exposed mud. And the willows and the cottonwoods have explicitly timed their feeding to that moment. Well, they don't want to release the water in late spring. They want to hold the water for summer for agriculture. So they hold it back. So the scouring doesn't happen. And salt cedar seeds can germinate anytime, anytime of year. Well, anytime of summer. So you, you prevent it, cottonwood and willow from, from its moment. And you allow this invader to do its to do its thing. Uh, so we just since it's again a human change is is at fault here. So this is how you get salt cedar breaks in the uh, Colorado River basins. Here it is along the Rio Grande. Uh, it's this sort. It's not. It's this fuzzy stuff in here. There's also a run a random donuts in here too. Anyway, all over the place. Well, you can try fire, but it just um, burns it down and just sprouts like that. You can try a mechanical removal, but you're not going to get all the roots and it sprouts like that. You can spray it, but then you always have the problem of spraying, you know, an herbicide next to water. You know, they say it's safe, you never know. Anyway, so the latest thing is um, bio um, bio control, and they do a really good job of trying to find an insect that will attack. Only that plant and nothing else. So it, it's still a lot of, it takes a lot of work and a lot of money, but once you get it, it tends to work pretty well. You're not going to eradicate it, you can just manage it. So it's worked pretty well, it's, done, it's doing its job, and then whoops, a federally endangered bird is happily nesting in the invasive salt cedar tree. What a nightmare for all master naturalists. What a nightmare for native plant society. What are we going to do now? Right? So it's a, and lots of other bird species live in it too. It's a good reminder that you removed the trees there would have been used. So what, you know, thank God they could use the tree at all. So we, in a way, it's a blessing. Um, and this is a reminder to land managers that, you know, if you're going to remove it when it's that extensive, you have to think about what are you going to replace it with in certain circumstances, right? Um, so it's a, this is a very complex story, which I, I hope I'm showing that, you know, nature is resilient. This bird managed without the trees it's used to. Um, right. Uh, what can you do with salt cedar? Uh, you can make it into beautiful twigs. This is Santa Fe again. You can see why I go for vacation. Uh, it's made into furniture. And I'm not sure what this is. Santa Fe Botanic Garden, I guess I'm supposed to give you some shade and be pretty. But uh, of course, people try to use native uh, invasive plants. You can get um, water hyacinth containers and baskets that contain the floor. Um, you can eat nutria, but no one will. You can eat lion fig. There's a lot of things people try to do to eat invasive plants. So, Important learnings here was it worked well, it worked too well. And um, it's we're the one we always think of them as they're invasive. You know, an army is invasive, it's out there to invading us. We call them a hundred worse and the, the, the zombie, zombie monsters at your door. We come up with all these great terms, but really it's always us. We're the ones that bring it in, we're the ones that promote it. Um, I forgot to say that 85% of the salt cedar in the US is a hybrid between two species that don't grow together in nature. One's from Eastern China and one's from Western China to Turkey. They've crossed here, so they have sort of higher vigor. And this is not uncommon too. A lot of, a lot of plants that are invasive are giving that because they, they're like a monster hybrid. Anyway, that um, pay attention to the role of species that's playing, and it's not just simply cutting it down. We have to think more broadly than that. Um, those are my books. Uh, the old one on the left is all the cool stuff about natives and then this invasive species. This is more, this isn't a how to manage. This is a think piece about how complex the issue is 